Well, I'll catch you up to speed here. Um, if you haven't been here, if you're a guest visiting, if you've just been sleeping through my sermons, whatever might be the case, um, we have been working our way through the book of Ruth for the last four weeks, and today we come to the end of this just beautiful, wonderful, amazing story. The very first week, if you remember, we covered Ruth chapter 1. We learned that a man by the name of Elimelech moved his wife Naomi and their two sons from Bethlehem to Moab. Elimelech had chosen to move his family there because there was a a famine that was going on um, back in Bethlehem. So he had hoped to find better times in Moab. And what you need to know about the story, though, is that, that Moab is a bad place if you're a Jew. The the Moabites worshipped a false god named Chemosh. Chemosh was a fertility god. And and, and the result of that was the Moabites were known just to be radically, wildly, terribly sexually perverse. Uh, Some bad people. And the tribe of Moab was founded from the offspring of an incestuous relationship. And and so there weren't other God-following, Yahweh-following people there. They worshipped a god other than the god of Israel. And, and that is where Elimelech has chosen to move his family. When they get to Moab, the two sons, whose names are Malon and Kilion, and as I mentioned, not names to suggest to your family to name children or grandchildren. You don't want to name them Malon and Kilion. They're, we'll talk about that some other time, but they're bad names. But these two sons, they take on Moabite wives. And we see in the story, after an unspecified period of time, dad dies and both of the sons die, leaving these three women, Naomi plus her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, without any protection, without any provision. Now, Naomi, the matriarch of the family, she catches word that back in her homeland, back where her family is, back where she grew up in Bethlehem, well, good harvests are starting up again. So she decides, well, there's nothing keeping me here. I've got nothing here. Let's move back home with hopes of finding better times there, right? And at first, Orpah and Ruth, uh, they both start off on this journey with Naomi. But part of the way into the journey, a short little ways into the journey, Orpah gets to thinking about it. And and, uh, Naomi even kind of encourages her a little bit that, you know, maybe I should stay in Moab, right? Maybe... Maybe moving to Bethlehem isn't for me. So Orpah, with Naomi's blessing, leaves and goes back to her homeland. Ruth, on the other hand, the other daughter-in-law, Naomi has also kind of encouraged her and said, you know, it would be okay if you want to go back. Um, Ruth, however, takes a very different track than does Orpah. Ruth, instead of going back to her homeland, going back to her family, going back to the place that she knew, Ruth clings to Naomi and and it says, Ruth says to Naomi, Naomi, I'm not leaving you for any reason. Basically. She says, I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to die where you die, where you people are. They will be my people who your God is. That will be my God. And, and, And then she even invokes a curse upon herself and says, if I violate this in some way, may your God strike me dead. Right? So she's pretty serious. She covenants with Naomi that, Wherever Naomi wants to go, Ruth is going with her. And as we talked about, this speaks largely to the character of Naomi. Um, Naomi, the name Naomi means sweetheart. And, and, and by all appearances, she must have been a tremendous, amazing woman, uh, a great woman of God and, and a woman who is very much worthy of respect. And so Ruth hitches her future to her. And, and Naomi and Ruth make their way back to Bethlehem. And at the conclusion of chapter 1, it shows the ladies showing up at Bethlehem. And, and some of the local Bethlehem ladies look and they go, oh, yeah. You know, because it's been a decade that, that she's been gone or, or longer. And, and they go, oh, yeah, we remember you. You're, you're Naomi, right? Yeah, yeah, we remember you. And Naomi says, yes, I am Naomi, but I'm no longer that sweetheart. Call me Mara because I'm bitter right? I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Call me Mara because I'm grumpy at the Lord, right? She still loved God, but she was grumpy with God. And so, excuse me. (coughs) 
And so it concludes kind of on that note. And we see throughout that first chapter just the providence of God, that God's fingerprints are all over the storyline, that he is looking out for his people in that story. And that brings us to chapter 2, where we find Ruth. Ruth is out gleaning in the fields. And if you don't know what gleaning is, gleaning is the process uh, whereby poor people could go out into a field, they could collect some leftover sheaves of, of wheat or whatever the particular crop in that field might be. Uh, the, the rules of the day, particularly among the Jews, was that you were to leave certain portions of your land unharvested intentionally so that the poor, so that the widowed could go out and collect their own. It wasn't a handout. It was a hand up. You had to do the work yourself, but at least... You could go and get some grub and you wouldn't starve, hopefully. You might not make a living off of it, but you'd at least be able to put some food on your table. So that's uh, the system uh, in the Old Testament of how they made that work. And, and so Ruth is out in this field. She's, she's gathering the wheat. Or, and the field owner is a, a godly man by the name Boaz. Well, Boaz comes out to his field that day and He's looking around, surveying his field, watching his workers work, seeing how the crops are coming in. And he noticed somebody over in the corner there. And he says, uh, hey, guys, who's that over there? She's not one of my people. Oh, 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 oh Boaz, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, her name's Ruth. Ruth, she came here with uh, Naomi, now Mara. Yeah, Naomi Mara. They came here. They were Moab or something. Yeah, that, that's who. So, so his servants kind of give him the lowdown on who, who she is. And we see in the storyline there that Boaz, you know, kind of the eyebrow goes up. He takes a little bit of an interest. And so he tells his men working the field, nobody is to lay a finger on her. And not only that, but then he gives her social standing with the women. Then he gives her some extra food. Then he invites her over for dinner. Then he gives her take home. And, and I mean, he just starts blessing her right and left, right? He offers her a job basically through the end of the harvest season. So he's, he's really stepping up at the plate. He's really, you know, taking some big steps. And, and when Ruth gets home with all of this blessing from Boaz, Naomi convinces her, yeah, you need to keep going back to this guy's fields, right? He's hooking us up. It's a, it's a great blessing. And, and then at the end of that portion of the story, they realize, Naomi says, oh, yeah, and by the way, by marriage, I'm actually related to Boaz. So he's in the family even, right? Well, then we come to chapter 3. So things were getting interesting in chapter 2, but we get to chapter 3, and we find six to eight weeks have passed. Boaz... I don't know, has he gotten cold feet? We don't know. Boaz hasn't made any further moves. He's just kind of not been interacting with Ruth, right? And, and the harvest, the barley harvest, the wheat harvest are going on. And, and he's not stepped up to the plate. He's not continued to pursue Ruth. And, and, and like so many men, it seems uh, Boaz doesn't really maybe know what to do. We don't know. But he doesn't send any cards. He doesn't text her. He doesn't send her any emails, right? He didn't send her any flowers, no coffee dates, none of that kind of stuff. And time is beginning to run out in the storyline. Naomi realizes the harvest is coming to a conclusion and Ruth's chances of latching onto Boaz might be down to their last day or two. So Naomi, being a wise woman, hatches a plan, right? And she realizes... Ruth, you're going you're gonna to have to press the situation here a little bit because Boaz, he's not making it happen. So she basically tells Ruth, she says, Ruth, you need to go get yourself dolled up. I mean, because you think about it. Ruth, Ruth is dirt poor, so she probably has one outfit. And so all Boaz has ever seen is Ruth out in the field with like the nasty, dirty, stinky, pitted out, sweaty dress that she wears every day to the fields, Right? And if you know what they fertilized fields with in those days, she's been walking around in that, collecting food, right? She doesn't look her best. Naomi says, hey, go get dolled up. Go, go get out your good going to church dress, right? You do your nails, do your hair, put on some perfume. You know, va va voom, right? Go, go, go get it, get it. So when he sees you the next time, that eyebrow will go up again and he'll have some interest, right? So then she instructs Ruth. She says, not only are you going to doll yourself up, but 
there's going to be a party. This is the end of the harvest season. And when they're done harvesting the grain, there's a big celebration. And so the guys are going to be having a celebration. And, and go down to where they're having a celebration. Just watch. Just, just keep your eye on what's going on, right? And then when Boaz, after everything winds down, and Boaz goes in because he'll be sleeping with his grain for the evening, when he goes in and he lays down on the threshing floor and he goes to go to sleep at night, pay attention before he blows out his lantern. Look and see where it is he lays down. And then once he blows out his lantern, and he lays down, puts his head on that rock for a pillow, then you're going to go in. You're going to quietly go in. And then, you know what you're going to do? You're going to lift the blanket off of his feet, which sounds a little bit weird, but that's what she tells him to do, right? Lift the blanket off of his feet. And if you're like me, if you lifted the blanket off my feet, that would wake me up, right? And so lift the blanket off his feet and then just lay down at his feet, kind of snuggle up against his feet. Just lay there. And then Boaz will tell you what to do next, right? So she does exactly as Naomi instructs. Rolls up the the blanket, lays down at his feet. Boaz says, who's there? And she says, it's me, Ruth, right? And Ruth proceeds to ask Boaz to spread his cloak over her, which is the Old Testament way of saying, I want you to want me, right? Can we make this a permanent thing? Ruth is having a DTR moment with him, defining the relationship, right? She doesn't propose, but she proposes that he proposes effectively, right? Now, Boaz is both shocked and pleased that she has come to him. And he offers up, literally in the moment, a prayer of blessing for her. And then he says to her, he promises to her, first thing tomorrow morning, I'm going to go to town and take care of the business of making you my wife. But then he says, but there is one potential fly in the ointment. Boaz tells Ruth, first i got to go talk to another man before I can do this. Because you see, Mr. What's-His-Face, he's actually first in line. He's more closely related. So by rights, he has the first place to redeem you. He has first choice in, in being responsible for you. This was an Old Testament system among the Jews and a system that, that worked well largely to take care of widows. And so he's like, I'm not the first one in line, even though I want you I I need to make sure I I do this the honorable way. I take the right steps. And so we need to go and check with him. Well, that brought us to last week, Ruth chapter 4, right? Boaz starts off in the story going into town to the city gate where all of the major business transactions of those days took place. And when Boaz gets there, he grabs 10 other respected elders of the community and, and because he's going to need a witness for this transaction he's about to do. He gets these 10 guys. He says, come over here, sit down with me. You need to witness this legal proceeding. And, and wouldn't you know, very providentially, exactly at the time he gets his 10 guys gathered together, Well, then who comes walking by? Mr. What's-His-Face, the guy he needs to meet, right? So he comes walking in, strolling through the gates, right? Boaz goes over and grabs him and says, Hey, I got some business to do with you. Come over and sit down. I got guys. We need to talk. And so they go over. They sit down. Boaz goes on to inform the man, You know what? You are first in line to purchase this land that is owned by the widow Naomi. So if you want this land, you need to redeem it. You need to take it. You need to buy it. Otherwise, I'm going to. Well, Mr. What's-His-Face goes, oh, free land. You know, some land I could buy. You know, land is hard to come by back in those days, just like it is today. More land sounds good. That'll expand my empire. Yeah, okay. So the guy goes, sure, I'll buy the land. Sounds like a good deal. And at that moment, you kind of start worrying about the storyline, right? If he buys the land, well, then Boaz can't marry Ruth. But Boaz kind of has a couple of cards up his sleeve still. So he says, but after the guy agrees to buy the land, here's something you need to know. There's some other stuff that comes with this land, right? He then goes on to inform the man, not only are you buying this land, but along with the land comes this bitter old mother-in-law. Her name is Mara, right? Well, this guy is already beginning to think, I already got one mother-in-law too? Whew, I don't know. And then he says, and not only that, not only do you get the bitter old lady, 
You get this Moabite woman who you're going to have to take to be your wife, who you're going to have to provide children, children and, and the implication therein is they will also inherit part of your land. Well, now this guy's going, well, grumpy mother-in-law, Moabite wife, I've already got a wife and a mother-in-law, what am I going to do? My wife will kill me if I'd come home like this. So he's like, well, you know, I thought it was a good idea, but I was wrong. I don't want the land. It's not that much. I don't need it. So he says, no, I'm not going to redeem the land. Well, immediately Boaz says, it's mine. He's the next one in line. And so he hands the guy his sandal, which was a, a way of communicating at the time that the transaction had legally taken place. Uh, the man steps back, has no claims at that point then to the land or to the women. And then Boaz publicly says that he is announcing to everyone who can hear, he's buying the land, he's taking Ruth to be his wife. And everyone at that moment begins to pray this prayer of blessing actually upon Boaz for his actions. And, and, and they pray a, a prayer of blessing that, that children will come from this marriage. Um, within that. And so that's kind of where we left off last week. So that brings us finally, that's a long introduction, right? But good story. It brings us back to where we are this week. If you're following along, you can grab out a Bible. If you've got an iPad or iPhone, feel free to fire that up. We're going to be in Ruth chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Um, Ruth 4.13, and we're going to finish off Ruth this week, okay? So Ruth 4.13, if you've got a Bible, feel free to open it up. And I'm going to read the verses, and then we're going to talk about it, and we'll keep on moving. 4.13 says this, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. So our story is coming full circle today, finally. Finally, they get to be married, right? Four Sundays ago, we started out with marriage and death. Today, we get marriage and life. And, and the greatest gift that, that God gives is, is salvation through Jesus Christ. And the second greatest gift I think that he gives is he gives us marriage. It's, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. And the book of Proverbs calls a good wife a crown, not a cancer, right? Ruth is a crown. And it's not just that we men want to be married, ladies, but we do want a crown too, you know? We, we want a, a woman who will be a jewel to our family. And I will readily admit I'm blessed to have one of those. I have a, a great, great wife. Now, Ruth, of course, didn't start off as a crown though, did she? No. She started off coming from a bad family, from the bad part of town, so to speak. See, the, as I said earlier, the Moabites, they worshipped a false god. They worshipped Chemosh. And they were known as a sexually perverse people. And she was widowed. She was jobless. She was flat broke. And she had just newly converted to the faith. So at least at the surface, Ruth probably didn't look like all that great of a catch at that point. So what that says to us then is, there's hope for us, Right? That through God, the God of hope, if you're not a crown right now, you can be, right? If you're not a jewel of a person, God can still use you and turn you into one of them. I think there's something incredible, incredible here to learn. It's not where you come from, but that God can redeem anyone, anywhere, from anything. If you meet Jesus, everything can change. You can have a horrible situation just like Ruth did and have a wonderful conclusion just like Ruth did. That goes for guys, gals, all of us. We need to be a crown. We need to aspire to be a jewel in someone else's life. Meet Jesus, change your life, and become a crown. And allow me for a moment, if you will, and it's not really like you've got a whole lot of choice because I've got a microphone and you don't, but... Uh, Allow me for a moment to get a little bit off topic and talk a little bit about marriage, since we're talking about marriage. Genesis 1 and 2, right? God made male and female. And God said, it's not good for the man to be what? Alone. Notice how the men knew that? It's not good for us to be alone, right? Every man in the room knows that to be true. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to know that it's not good to leave us men on our own. I mean, I'm a married man, and I fully agree with that. It's not good for us to be alone. And the very first thing in the Bible where God says it's not good is for men to be alone. So God's answer, of course, to that is a woman. Man and woman made for one another. God providentially brings the woman and the man together. 
It is God who makes them, and it is God who creates the marriage, and it's God who brings us together, and it's God who makes it good. Did you catch that? It's God who makes the marriage good. Left to ourselves, especially, especially I think us men, left to ourselves, we'd screw up that marriage, right? In our selfish, self-centered, sinful ways. We would find ways to blow it up. What holds it together? Jesus. Jesus needs to be the center of your relationship, the center of your marriage. If he isn't, it's probably going to get painful for you at some point. It may be painful anyhow, but it'll be more painful without Jesus. Truth is, being married, we, those of us who are married will say this, it can be tough at times. But doing it without God and doing it without God's grace, no thank you, I'm not interested. I mean, I'm enough of a, a screw-up of my own to wreck my marriage, so I, I need Jesus in it to keep it happening, to keep it going, to keep it moving forward. And the Bible says it was not good for man to be alone. So it was not good for Boaz to be alone. So God brings Ruth into his life. Providence, right? God was working behind the scenes even when Boaz didn't know it. God had no idea this lady was moving from Moab, right? He had no idea that was his future wife. But God was in the details. So back to our story. In every biblical marriage, there are are two key aspects, both of which we see today. The first is covenant, and and we just got that. And the second part is consummation, and we get to that next. And it says that then Boaz went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. So Ruth has gone from being a, a poor, broken Moabite widow working in the fields without a whole lot of hope to a woman married to an incredibly godly man, a wealthy man who is well-respected in the community, who is gracious in dealing with other people. And not only that, she gets a son, a blessed son, a son to carry on the family name, a son who will take care of her in her old age, right? A son who will grow up to protect her. A son. She's hit the lottery. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I I, I like to believe, you know, because I can believe what I want in this respect. I like to believe like on their honeymoon, this little guy was conceived, right? That's kind of that wishful thinking. But what a great day. She gets married. She gets pregnant. Woohoo, right? We're coming up on Mother's Day not too long. What a beautiful story. Verse 14. The woman said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who on this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. We have a lot of uh, grandparents in the room today, I know. And and many of you can speak to this as truth, right? Grandchildren can give you a a new vigor for life, right? They they can just energize you in ways that other things in life can't. Now, I also know they also suck the energy out of you because when when the grandkids go home, you're like, right? Anybody else ever experienced that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it with my in-laws. My, son's, my son is awesome. My son is a high-energy little boy. And after a couple of days, they're like, okay, break time, right? Because he'll wear you out. He will. And that's a good thing. So, but overall, grandkids can be very, very reinvigorating. Now, as I was thinking about this story, I was thinking a few years back, uh, a number of years back now, Kim and I were putting a a roof on a a house that we own in the Twin Cities, a rental property. And so one afternoon, I'm up on the roof, and I'm working, and and I'm actually up there scraping all the shingles off this roof, and I happen to be there all by myself working. And out comes the the man who lives in the house. Um, He went by the name, well, his nickname was Swede, and so we'll call him Swede. Swede comes out of the house, and he's got his two grandkids with him. And they're out just kind of playing around, and and they had a football, so they're just out tossing the old pig skin back and forth. And and pretty soon, you know, they start running some patterns. Well, as I'm scraping these shingles off, pretty soon it turns on to a full-fledged game of tackle football. It's grandpa against his two grandkids. And then they're like out there rolling around in the dirt, getting grass stains. He's got cowboy boots on, so every time Dwayne or Swede would go to plant with those cowboy boots, you know, he'd go sliding across the lawn and end up on his behind. And they would all land in a pile on top of him, just laughing and giggling, and just having a, a wonderful, amazing, great, great time. And it was just squeals of glee and laughter and joy and 
it was so clear that he was enjoying this time with his grandchildren. Now, it's a safe bet, folks. He doesn't go out in his front yard and do that when they're not there, right? He doesn't go diving and sliding across his lawn on his belly. I know, Dwayne, he doesn't do that, right? And so grandkids are a blessing, and, and they keep you young. And, and, and that's kind of what's, what's being told here in the story, that these children are a blessing. And then verse 15 continues on, and it says, you know, they're talking with Naomi and with Ruth, and it says, For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. The women here are stating that, that Ruth is a huge blessing to Naomi, and, and by saying that having Ruth in her life is better than seven sons is a big deal because seven is the perfect number, right? It's not a mistake that they said seven. Seven is perfection in the Bible. And seven sons is the Israelite idea of the perfect family. And these ladies are saying, Ruth, you have even better than perfection. Or, or Naomi, I'm sorry. Naomi, you have even better than perfection. Even better than seven sons. You have Ruth right? She's such a blessing. Ruth is clearly well-respected among these women of Bethlehem. And what a turn, because when she came in, she was a stinky, dirty, homeless, poor, you know, Moabite woman with no social standing that nobody would probably have given the time of day to. Now they're singing her praises and saying she's an abundant, amazing, incredible blessing. Naomi has gone from having to bury a husband and her two sons to being incredibly and wonderfully blessed by Ruth and a grandson. Verse 16 says then, Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap, and she cared for him, right? So Naomi, who was being called Mara for a while, I think at this point she might have changed her name back to Naomi, right? She's no longer bitter. Naomi begins to care for this little boy. She's going to look out for him. She's going to look after him. I can can just imagine her as grandma, you know, tickling his tummy, blowing little raspberries on his cheek, right? Right? And then as he gets older, spoiling him rotten. Because that's what grandparents are good for, right? She's sitting there in the rocking chair, rocking him. Rocking him to sleep, burping him when he needs it, changing him, teaching him as he grows, playing with him, right? Right? She's going to be part of his life. Grandparents, I know, like I said, we have many of you here today. You can be an incredible blessing to your grandchildren. I know this firsthand. When I was a child, that's a little bit of my backstory. When I was very young, um, third and fourth grade, my mother had some major medical problems that led to, before the age of 30, she had had two strokes and an artificial heart valve, which meant as a young family, we were not well off. And my dad had to work. There was no way we would keep the house with the mortgage. This is back in the 80s with interest rates. You remember what they did? Yeah. And so my dad was working every hour he could. And whatever hours he wasn't, he was sitting bedside with my mother at the hospital. And so I was blessed to be able to go and live with my grandparents, who happened to live about a half block down the street from my elementary school. So I could stay with grandma and grandpa during the week, live with them for five days, And then, as I mentioned, grandparents, you do need a break. So they would ship me off to my aunt and uncle, and we'd live with them on the weekend. We all went to the same church, so I'd still see my grandparents every day. And and it worked great. It allowed my parents the margin to somehow make it through an incredibly difficult season of life. And it allowed my brother and I to have at least some sense of normalcy. So my grandparents were a tremendous, tremendous blessing to me. I was incredibly, incredibly thankful that they were able to be there for me, to be my help. And so, so a tremendous blessing you can be as grandparents. And now hopefully that will never happen to you. And it's got to be that sort of dire circumstance, but you can still be in an abundant, amazing blessing. You can still make a tremendous difference in your grandchildren's life. Verse 17, the women living there said, Naomi has had a son. And then they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Now, every time I read this part of the story, it strikes me as a little bit strange, right? We don't have a lot to go on here. We don't don't 
have a lot to understand this, but basically what happens is like all the neighbor ladies come over to the house, you know, like, like Naomi's Bible study ladies or the ladies she has coffees with on Saturday morning or whatever. They all stop by and name the child. I don't know if that's how everybody did things in those days, but that's kind of how it appears in the story. But these ladies stop on in. Ruth, are you home? We're here to name her baby. Okay, I guess. If that's what works for you. And so they name him Obed, right? As we've talked about over the past few weeks, a Hebrew name has meaning, has significance. And and Elimelech, if you remember, means God is my king. Um, Naomi meant sweetie. Malon and Kilion really meant basically death and sickness and disease, which is why you shouldn't name your kids that, right? And so they name him Obed, which means worshiper or servant of God. And then scripture says, Obed was the father of Jesse, right? Okay. And Jesse, oh yeah, he was that guy who was the father of David. Anybody ever heard of David before? Yeah, that's King David, by the way, right? You've heard of that guy before. Guy's kind of a big deal. Yeah? So Ruth, through this love, through this family, We get this lineage of Jesus. And who comes from that very same lineage? Jesus. And we see that below in verses 18 through 22. From Ruth, we get Obed. And then from David, we get to Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. The Bible, the story of the Bible from the very beginning page to the very end page is about Jesus. Verse 18. Verse 18 starts with Perez. Perez, as I mentioned last week, was the founding father of the city of Bethlehem. And rather than just reading you these verses, I'm going to jump ahead in the Bible to uh, Matthew 1.5, where it says this. It says, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse was the father of David. (coughs) Excuse me. Then in Matthew 1.16, it says this. It says, then Jacob, the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is the Christ. All of this, all of this from this little backwater town named Bethlehem, all of this from a a very simple people, otherwise normal people, but people who nonetheless made their name in history by participating in the story of Jesus. So on this day, I remind you, Take nothing for granted. You never know, even now, what your son or daughter may grow up to be. See, I had a career before I was in ministry. My parents thought I had figured life out. And I had a pretty pretty successful career before I ever thought about going into ministry. And my parents were proud of me. I was doing a job that I think, frankly, my dad was envious of. He would have loved to have had my job working for the Boy Scouts. And so I, they kind of thought I had it all figured out. And then er, God redirected me. Now look at me today. Here I am, right? So there's hope for everyone, I guess is what I'm saying. But you just never know what kind of difference you as a mom, you as a dad, you as a grandma, you as a grandpa, aunt and uncle, even you as a neighbor can make on the next generation. But what I do know is you can be intentional about the legacy of faith that you leave. And if you leave a legacy of faith, it can impact for generations as it does in our story here today. It can impact your family and your community for generations. So I pray, I pray that you would be as Boaz and as Ruth and as Naomi that decades from now, through intentional choices of your own, you will be able to look back and others will be able to look back and see the impact that you made because you choose to live your faith. I pray that every day you will make choices to invest in the next generation and that the world and that your family and our community will be better for it because you loved Jesus. So as you go this week... Go seek and find intentionally ways to love those 
you have influence over. Make a difference that can last for generations. Amen? Let's pray.